All our strength, our will, has the power to shape worlds. Yet it is kept in check, restrained by our beliefs, our doubt. Everyone is made up by the events of their past, and it forms walls around one's spirit, or breaks such walls down. The mind makes some powerless and gives strength to others. Because we are not ready to give up our ties or codes, we surrender ourselves. We become slaves to teachings and belief. That is why belief will always rule you. To truly believe in an ideal, you must be willing to betray it, to not to follow it so dogmatically. That is the lesson of strength. I remember that lesson. <laughs> Uh, uh, with understanding Khan. Yes, I remember that lesson. If you guys uh, have seen my reaction to understanding Khan uh, of the World Eaters made by um, the Amber King, then you know. You, you, you'll know this, uh, uh, th this line of sentence, definitely. Alone, Valdor stood, staring down the remnants of the Thunder Warriors, led by Ushatan and Grand Provost Marshal, Wuma Kandawire, in alliance with the geneticist Amar Astarte. They stood against what the Imperium was becoming, fighting for accountability, democracy. They knew that plans had been made, generals to replace the old, ones accountable only to the Emperor, and they had to stop it. They were fighting for what? <laughs> Oh, these these people! Like, who who did they think they were following this whole time? Did the emperor tell them, "Yes, we're going to create a utopia for humanity. It's going to be beautiful. We're going to have democracy. We're going to have responsibility and accountability. You know, it's going to be amazing." Did he actually tell them that? Uh, tell them that, or did they just make this stuff up in their own minds and and they believe that the emperor would? you know, follow suit with their ideals. Come on. Guys, wake up. Wake up. Wake up. This is not... <laughs> this is not what you people have been dreaming about. This Imperium is not going to be what you people have been dreaming about. Uh, that, that's very funny. That is very funny. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Constantine told Kandawire and Ushitan that there were no new generals. But there were new armies. Behind Constantine, silhouetted in the driving muck of the ice storm, where the snow and hail screamed and the frozen earth cracked, 10,000 helm lenses suddenly ignited, then began to advance. The Adeptus Astartes, genetically altered super soldiers, created with the meshing of specialized organs and pumped with stimulants. Faster, stronger, and more disciplined than a mortal man, and yet far more genetically stable than the Thunder Warriors. Armed with the Imperium's finest armors and weapons, this new breed of super soldier was unleashed upon Ushatan and his remaining brothers. The Thunder Warriors were like lions, primal strength, tearing and breaking the wash of Astartes flowing through their ranks. But one by one they were torn down. These new men hunted like wolves, bringing down the larger and stronger beasts in front of them as a group. Constantine with every slash and stab with his spear reaped death. His precision and skill were utterly perfect. Perceiving in mid-melee minute drops in speed, Due to lactic acid build up, he was moving fast enough that the Thunder Warriors couldn't even register his movements or parries. The gap between Constantine and Ushatan closed. Spear met two handed sword in a melee so brutal, so mind numbingly fast that to bear witness to it, vibrations would cascade through your weak, mortal form. Ushatan taunted Constantine, trying to punch through both his physical and emotional walls, but it was fruitless. I am nothing. Constantine's life, his thoughts, his feelings were utterly 
unimportant. The two superhumans clashed and struck, fighting at the pinnacle of human martial prowess. But it was not enough for the Primarch of the Thunder Warriors. Constantine rammed his spear through his enemy, driving him to the ground as the last of the Thunder Warriors were cut down around them. With the snow falling, and Ushatan's black blood spilling, he railed against Contentin one last time, telling him, I pitied you. I meant it. I'm not trying to goad you. I really do pity you. I lived, Captain General. It was short, and it was painful, but by the Nine Hells, I lived. I'd rather have it that way than yours. No joy, no hate, no fear. Unbreakable without growth, immortal without passion. What more can he take from you that he hasn't already? The mind makes some powerless and gives strength to others. Because we are not ready to give up our ties or codes, we surrender ourselves. We become slaves to teachings and belief. That is why belief will always rule you. To truly believe in an ideal, you must be willing to betray it. Constantine, a man with no ego, no passion. It had been purged in the elevation the Emperor had done to him. He was the epitome of control, an emotional state of neutral. Had he ever felt the roar of rage, excitement, or joy in his blood, like Ushatan? Had he ever cried, felt love, or true happiness? How much of his humanity had the Emperor taken? And yet with the one thing he was left with, duty, did he really believe in it? Could he make that choice? Could he, like a Woma Candlewire, choose to believe in the Imperium? Could he, like her, be willing to betray it? Was he a creature of power or strength? Did he ever make any fundamental choices in his own life? Did the Emperor alter him because he feared a rival? One who had the strength to make choices? In the ashes of victory, Constantine reflected on the slain Primarch of the Thunder Warriors. A man he confessed he did like, but the duty remained and his death was necessary for the future of the Imperium. A warmer Kandawire was left alone, the dreams of a diplomatic Imperium fading with the opposition that could do nothing. The genetic laboratories in duality had been sabotaged by Amar Astarte, disgusted with how far the Emperor had gone and was seemingly willing to go. A fruitless scheme counteracted by the Imperium's own copies of the research and materials. The operation for the production of this army was to be taken from the hundreds to the thousands, to then the hundreds of thousands. Constantin did not like these Astartes. Too much imperfection in them. They were too human. He had been there decades ago, during their creation when he had borne witness to one of the Imperium's greatest failures. Deep in the Imperium's innermost sanctums, under layers of protection, thought to be so ironclad, lay the new generals. Forged for war in the stars, the Primarch Project. Twenty specimens, created from the Emperor's own genetic material, were the foundation of an army that would conquer the galaxy, but they were lost. A tear into the warp opened, within their gestation chamber, ripping the capsules from their ceramite foundations. Constantine and Amar Astarte had rushed within, recovering as much research and material as they could. With the Emperor of Mankind, utilizing his enormous psychic might to hold the collapsing roof. As Constantine and Amar rushed, the loss of these new Primarchs, these generals, was insurmountable. The truth behind their loss was only known to the Emperor, Malkador and Constantine, a secret kept even from Constantine's custodian brothers. Chaos. Within the war. The immaterial. The reflective realm of rippling psychic emotions. Some foul and evil stirred. Four dark entities 
eldritch horrors that call themselves gods. Embodiments of humanity's worst tendencies, their very existence was only a supportive claim to the idea that humanity must be united together, lest the influence of these foul gods corrupt and warp us. With the trial by fire of the Adeptus Astartes, created from the surviving material of the Primarch project, Constantine declared that the Imperium was truly born. The palace was now secure. All it needs now is a throne, a symbol, and a weapon. A resource that would guide the Imperium through the warp. A golden throne. With you, you know, I'm quite surprised that the Emperor has not told the truth about, you know, these Chaos Gods to the rest of the Custodians. He's only... I mean, this is a secret that's only been kept amongst the Triumphant, you know, Malkidor, Emperor himself, and uh, the Captain General of the Custodies. Um, yeah, I'm quite surprised that he didn't tell the rest of the Custodians. It's not like they're going to tell anyone, you know. They're not going to be blurting it out to other people that, hey guys, there's Chaos Gods and the Emperor knows about this, you know. So, yeah, I'm quite surprised he didn't tell the rest. The preparation underway, Constantine heard the news from Malkador that planted a seed of caution. The Emperor of Mankind had felt his Primarch's presence out there in the galaxy. Immediately Constantine's mind went to threat evaluation. What if these Primarchs had been tainted? Could they ever trust these superhumans raised without the guidance and conditioning of the Imperium? And you see, this is what I also like. Valdo is not thinking about his position as Captain General of the Custodians. He's not thinking about his future, about serving the Emperor. No, he's worried about whether these Primarchs uh, will be able to serve and, you know, uh, protect the Emperor like how he is. Because that's his main focus, the Emperor of Mankind. Nothing else, nobody else. Not, not even his own self because he knows he's a tool he's meant to be used and whenever the emperor is satisfied with him and he, you know the emperor wants to discard him he will have no qualms about that you know that's what i like about the custodians is that they know what they are and they know that you know this is not about them this is about the person who wields them and that is the emperor of mankind yeah Perhaps they should be destroyed, but most troubling of all, the Emperor had called them his sons. It was like commuting with a star, all-powerful, brilliant, so far above the existence of all others. Constantine knew exactly what the Emperor was, what he had seen, and what he had done and what he intended to do, but it caught him off guard. When this timeless, godlike creature expressed humanity, sons, they were meant to be weapons. Malkador told Constantine it was not often, but there were periods where the Emperor seemed more connected to his humanity, something Constantine accepted, but did not understand. But his regimented mind did not have the space to question. Constantine's caution, his distrust would only heighten in the events to come. In an interaction white from all Imperial records, Constantine noticed some suspicious activity taking place within the Imperial Palace. He and the custodians were the pinnacle of discipline, exhibiting a caution and concentration so absolute that any threat to the Emperor was met by guardian spear and death. In the Imperium's royal courtyard, the Emperor descended down in a thunderhawk to the surface, but an imperfection, an error was caught, as Garudo had failed to respond. The deeply coded language voxed into silence. Atop an angled roof, overlooking the landing pad, a figure lay in watch, a threat donned in the custodian's own golden auramite armor. Constantine launched himself at this imposter, like a golden thunderstorm, his personal Apollonian spear lashing with tongues of lightning. Despite his size, despite the bulk of his armor, 
He moved as smoothly as a dancer along the narrow ridge. He was the Emperor's greatest champion, Terra's mightiest warrior, and peerless in combat. A duel broke out. The two enormous figures matched each other blow for blow. Something too fast for the mortal eye to see. A contest that was broken apart just as quickly as it had started. As Markador the Sigilite told them both to stand down. Constantine asked this intruder who he was. The large superhuman responded, I am Alpharius, one of the Primarchs, donning the armor and personal weapon of his fellow custodian, Garudo. Only Garudo's death would have allowed this Alpharius access to his equipment. Each custodian was a genetic masterpiece, a work of science and art. Each one of them the Emperor's finest, who accumulated names as they achieved and accomplished in the Emperor's name. Constantine himself had achieved nearly 2,000 names, each etched onto the inside of his own custodian armor. The loss of Garu Do, a loyal servant of the Emperor, was a magnanimous loss, and yet here he stood. Constantine's first interaction with a Primarch in the armor of a murdered brother. Interrogating this Alpharius, he revealed his purpose for his actions, to expose a weakness in the security of the Imperial Palace, a protection that needed to be impregnable, and any amount of sacrifice in the name of the Emperor's protection was worth spilling, though that did not mean he liked it. Constantine understood that Garrodo's death may have been necessary. He accepted it, but he was not devoid of all emotion, and still felt kindred for his custodian brothers. Alpharius went further, saying that Constantine could not think like an enemy of the Emperor. His mind was forged with unbreakable loyalty. He could never choose to betray the Emperor, even in thought a weakness their enemies could exploit. It would be that weakness, it would be this attitude to war, treating it like a dark game that led Constantine to develop a way to fortify the palace from threats of that nature. Cre but who or what would be powerful enough to threaten the Emperor? Who or what would be powerful enough to threaten the Emperor and to compromise the security the custodians have designed? Because I don't see Xeno, uh, you know, species ever getting anywhere close to the Emperor. I don't think I'll ever see something like that because the custodians are just so powerful and, and accurate, you know. I don't see chaos, uh, 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 you know, chaos warped demons or... Uh, you know, humans that have been uh, controlled by chaos coming anywhere near the Emperor. The only people who are a threat to the Imperium of Man are the very people that the Emperor has created. And that is the Primarchs. That is the Astartes. They are the only threat towards the Emperor and his uh, ambitions and his uh, a plan, Grandmaster plan. There's nothing else. So if you guys did not exist, this would not be necessary. That custodian wouldn't have to die. But we are here because, you know, the Emperor decided that, okay, I need to create these Primarchs. So the only threat to the Emperor and to the Imperium of Man is its out, it's itself. That's the only thing. The very things that the emperor has created but i i i, I accept i accept what um the primarch has done here you know trying to find a gap within the the security for the emperor of mankind i i accept i understand it's just it is a very hard pill to swallow mm. creating the blood games a contest poising the Emperor's own custodies against each other in a contest to reach the inner sanctums of the palace. The lesson had been important, as well as for the fact that this Primarch 
Alpharius had the potential to think like an enemy, something that only stoked the cautions of Constantine. After centuries of work, Origins armoured in steel and leather to brilliant Oromite gold, Constantine stood at the side of the Emperor. Terror had been unified, twenty legions of the Adeptus Astartes created, and an alliance with the Mechanicum of Mars. The vision was coming to fruition. The Emperor of Mankind declared the birth of the Great Crusade. Enormous armadas launched from terror, venturing into the cold void of space to conquer the galaxy. At the Emperor's side, Constantine began to battle upon countless worlds, facing horrifying Xenos and non-compliant colonies of mankind. Like ink in water, the boundaries of the Imperium spread, a die cast over millions, and then billions, and then billions upon billions. And then, after a decade of war, upon the world of Chthonia, a crime-ridden underhive, they found him. Horus Lupercal, number 16, a Primarch. A reunion that became a rally cry to the Imperium, as the first openly acknowledged Primarch had been found. With the Primarch reunited with his legion, his sons, Constantine finally began to understand why. Why the Emperor had forged such terrifying beings. Was collapsed under the onslaught of a genius Primarch-like mind. The effect they had on others, to be in their very presence made people weep. As the decades rolled past, more and more of them were found treated like long lost sons. There were some he respected, one such as Rogel Dawn, who in their first duel together, Constantine emerged victorious. Centuries of skill paired against the innate strength and speed of a Primarch, but never again did Dawn lose. These creatures learned fast. As the Imperium spread further and further across the galaxy, the Imperium of Mankind grew, transforming Terra into a bustling administration hub, something that over time drew more of the attention of Constantine, as the Primarchs and their legions spread out, conquering, leaving the cleanup and the real compliance to others. Decades upon decades of war, Constantine and the Custodians fought alongside their Emperor in achieving compliance across the galaxy, the dream. The grand vision at the Imperium's heart was within grasp. The Emperor decided that the Great Crusade was stable, and the next great work upon Terra would begin. On the world of Ulanor, cleanse the filthy Xenos, the Orcs. A grand triumph was prepared. Billions of Astra Militarum regiments, numerous Astartes legions, and their Primarchs stood in parade. Constantine stood at the side of the Emperor, as billions wept at the majesty of such a perfect being. Constantine saw his king, that his attention was required upon terror, and that there would be a new head of the Great Crusade. The War Master, Horus Lupercal, the 16th, the first found and favoured son. A new era had begun with Constantine following his emperor back to the throne world, the place of his birth and his transformation. Inside the innermost sanctums of the Imperial Palace, deep below the incredible technological masterpiece that was the Golden Throne, the work escalated, crafted in a time lost to history by a species long forgotten, a shimmering, disorientating, Vertigo-inducing tear into another realm was open. The webway. The mirror dimension highway. The grand plan. The future of the species lie ahead. But fate is never so kind. Um, the Grandmaster plan is centered around the webway, right? Um, I'm still not entirely sure, you know, what exactly was he going to do with it. Was he going to make it like a highway for humanity to traverse the entire galaxy without going into the warp? 
is that what he was using the webway for or was there going to be another reason for why he was uh you know trying to construct a webway for humanity uh you know i i still i'm still kind of lost on that uh you know important information um but hopefully you know the amber king can further explain the empress plans uh on the webway in particular mm. This is trouble. This does not sound good at all. Faldor was among them, his long cloak whipping in the ash-blown wind. More than 60 custodians of the Legio plus hundreds of support troops a regular auxiliary units were gathering for the push north. The Captain General looked almost untouched by combat. His armor was close to pristine, giving off a reflective aura under Prospero's blackening skies. His Apollonian spear seethed with energy, wrapping the golden shaft in a corona of false sunlight. He moved in the way he always did before battle, proud, confident, measured. Simonis bowed as he drew close. Grim labor, Vestarios, Valdor said. Indeed, Lord. Now that I see this place. He had been intending to say that he wished to see it utterly destroyed. He had seen sorcery of a scale and depravity he had never witnessed before, but he never got the chance. Welcome to Prospero, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, truly. This was just, it was unfortunate what happened to this planet, truly. These people, or should I say the people of Prospero and the civilization that they've created, you know, something that I would say would rival any uh, of the, what, like the core worlds around Terra, even Terra itself in terms of technological and arcane knowledge. Yeah, you, you know, Prospero was that planet, I would say. And these guys just came here to destroy it completely. Um, I'm thinking this is Lehman Russ, if I'm not mistaken, because he was there too. Yeah. And you know how he felt about Magnus the Red and, and his legion, a thousand sons. And, you know, uh, during the edict of Nikea, uh, the debates they had. Yeah. <sighs> the land raider jutted in close. Gunmetal grey, adorned with blood-red decorations of writhing serpents. It was the first of more than twenty such troop carriers, driven insanely fast through the rubble and kicking it up like a ship throws a bow wave. For a moment, Simonis never even saw Lehman Russ. He had certain expectations of Primarchs, that they marched on foot at the head of their armies, issuing orders in clear voices like his own master. He did not expect them to ride into war. Hanging off the back of a personal transport one-handed and swinging a damn sword around like a berserk. Constantine! Russ cried out, throwing himself from the still racing land raider and crunching heavily to the ground. I like the voice actor for, <laughs> for Lehman Russ. Yeah, it sounds cool. His blade, the one Imperial scholars called Bale Knight, but one which the walls themselves called Mjolnar, gleaned with malignant silver-white spitefulness. The Wolf King marched up to the Captain General, pelt swinging about him. Other warriors jumped down from the skidding land raiders, Varingiar terminators bearing axes and frost blades. Their liberally bloodied armor hung with fur scraps and bone totems. Valdor waited for him, flanked by his own honor guard. The custodians were taller than their counterparts, and no doubt more accomplished in some of the finer arts of combat. But there was something in the Varingiar's latent menace, bleeding from them with every swaggered move that chilled the blood. What took you so damn long? Russ demanded, hawking up a gobbit of spittle and loosing it on the ground. He went helmetless, the only one of them there who did. 
A statement of arrogant confidence that struck Simonis as borderline crazed. We've been killing witches without your sisters to blunt their fangs. Valdor stiffened a little. Is he talking about the Sisters of Silence? Okay. Was your wish to engage first, Lord? He said. True. Russ laughed. There was a strange light in those bestial eyes. Simonis thought he looked half mad. True. But you took your time when the order came. Order. No living man gave the Captain General an order, save the one who had created him. Our landings are completed, Valdor said calmly. We advance on all fronts, and the Knight Commander's sisterhoods are deploying throughout the city. Russ growled low in his throat, a sound that made Simonis' spine tingle. This will throttle them now. This will crush them. Hell's eyes, I have learned to hate these bastards, but still he eludes me. Is he even on this world? Asked Valdor doubtfully. We have detected nothing. Ross dropped to Valdor then. He was a little shorter, much broader. His armor stained and smeared where Valdor's was pristine. Oh yes, he hissed, smiling in a disconcertingly feral manner. I can smell him now. I can smell him hunkering down in his own filth. Fearful of me. Valdor remained unmoved. Even now I would see him taken to terror if it could be done. I would wish to know why. Russ laughed. A coarse bark that sent more spittles flying into Valdor's faceplate. You're still clinging to that? Ha! He turned away, swinging his great blade casually. I've known since I first saw this world that we would face one another. I did not come here for prisoners, Constantine. If my father had truly wished for such, he would not have sent me. You were not sent alone, Lord Russ. Russ glanced back at Valdor, a sly smile on his fanged face. Oh, that's it, is it? He laughed again. You have the power of magisterium and wish to cling to it. Russ paced back to him again. He was always moving, restless, like a tempest bound up inside the sham form of a man. Don't try to invoke the Lex with me. You claim to speak to my father, but you're not his blood, are you? Not like we are. That's what really gets you, isn't it? You're his instruments. He'd toss you aside in an instant if he cared to. We, though, we, we're family. Ruska. <laughs> oh, leave it. Add your. Okay. Okay. Okay, yeah, your family. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, oh! I didn't, I didn't expect Lehman to make me laugh this way. Oh, uh, yeah, mm, your family. It's okay. <laughs> Gave out a great belly laugh, then amused by the idea. You'll never understand that. Valdor didn't reply for an instant. Seemingly genuinely nonplussed. There are so many errors there. He said eventually. I don't even know where to start. Ah, uh, you, you know, let's just keep quiet. Let's just keep quiet. Let those with loud mouths talk all they want. You just stand here and look at them and listen to them. You know, yeah. But a reply never came. Fresh mortar blast boomed at the end of the avenue. The land raiders gunned their smoggy engines and the grav tank swung round to target new markers. In the far distance, where one of the many great pyramids slumped in burning ruin, and the clouds deepened towards inky vortex, the enemy was moving. They stir! Russ roared joyously, running back to the land raider and leaping onto its chassis. The walls were crying out battle chants, slamming their blades against their armor and slavering for action once more. Try to keep up, Constantine! 
You'll have to get your armor dirty sooner or later. And then the column powered up and thundered down the shattered avenue, followed by looping packs of grey hunters and whole contingents of bound auxilia. Simonus watched them go. The Aculon guard remained static around them, the helm faces magnificently blank. Is he in his right mind, Lord? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I think like I, the, the custodians are like parents, you know, they're like parents. And the Astartes and even the Primarch, they're like children. Maybe the Primarch are teenagers and then the, 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 the Astartes are like toddlers. You know, they're in the playground, playing around and, 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 and you know, fighting each other in the playground and, and, you know, throwing each other with sticks and stones and throwing sand and, you know, screaming and shouting. And the teenager who is the Primarch is, you know, being the cool guy because he's older than the Astartes. And, you know, he's far more powerful than the Astartes. You know, he's the teenager in the group there. And the custodians are parents. They're just watching these young people, you know, busy doing children things. So, yeah, it must be weird for them. Really, it must be weird for them to see these Astartes and, and the Primarch having this swagger about them, you know, looking all like, I'm the cool guy, I'm the best guy. You know, I've got this nice weapon, I've got this... Uh, gleaming armor that's been bloodied by my enemy, you know, and they just have this confidence about them, you know, and what makes them even more confident is that they're walking with their Primarch, you know, and the Primarch also exudes this energy of having this confidence about you. And Lehman Russ, he's like the epitome of such things, <laughs> really he is. So, you know, to, to the custodians, it must be a very odd thing to witness. You know, like, it's so weird. Like, even I, if I was there, I'd be like, why are you guys like this, really? This is supposed to be a serious matter, but you guys take it like it's just fun and games, you know? And here comes Lehman Russ with no helmet, you know, he, he believes no one's going to shoot him in the face. And somehow, some way, he, you know, he's right. <laughs> no one has shot, tried to shoot him in the face. He still has his eyes, he still has his face and his the rest of his skull and everything so yeah you know to the custodians these guys must be extremely weird and out of their minds Ugh. he ventured looking up at valdor inquiringly valdor didn't respond immediately he watched the wolves race into battle whooping and hollering it was impossible to gauge what he thought behind that ornate mask of oramite and cerulean Primarchs, he said finally, a single, withering expletive that sounded as close to a curse as the Captain General of the Ten Thousand would ever get. He has unleashed something he does not understand, Valdor said, staring at the distant Russ and speaking slowly and deliberately. Just as Magnus did before him, what is it with them all? Where did they get this monstrous pride? More flagstones cracked, and Simonus heard the sighing creak of breaking stone. The They've always been like this. They've always been like this. This is how the Emperor has created them. We don't know why, why he made them this way, but here they are. And, you know, from the planets where they were distributed by the Chaos Gods, you know, they were molded on those planets and they became individuals, you know, as they were uh, taught and uh, taken care of on those different planets. And we don't know why. Oh, what is that? Oh, sorry, guys. There was some sort of insect. <laughs> um, we don't know why, you know, the Emperor decided to make them this way and how they get this monstrous pride of theirs. You just have to accept that this is this is who they are. There was no sign of the Primarch, of the Thousand Sons now, only the endless bellows of his assassin. He lurched over to Valdor across the tilting flags, daring to reach out to pull him back from the edge. But at last, the Captain General turned away, as the debris of a world's demise blew about them in a furious edisis. He finally reached up to remove his helm. 
it came loose with a hiss, and Valdor inhaled the first unfiltered air of doomed Prospero. The Captain General was furious. Never before had Simonis witnessed such raw anger on that normally implacable face. They are the architects of this, Valdor said, speaking to the storm. All of them. He turned to look at his thrall. It could have been prevented. Yet when the hour came, we merely watched them being born. It's not like you could say anything to the Emperor to tell him, Emperor, please don't create these custodians. It's uh, uh, Primox, I mean, sorry. It's not like you could say anything to the Emperor like that, Valdo. You know, you, you know that you're a tool and you know you're not supposed to inquire, you know, why the Emperor makes these certain decisions. You know this. It's not as if you could say anything to him. Um, yes, you might have thought in your mind that, okay, making these Primarchs might not be the best, best idea, but because of your conditioning and because of how you were engineered and created by the Emperor, you can't ask the Emperor these kind of questions or, you know, tell him to stop. Don't make these Primarchs, you know. Um, but yeah, it's unfortunate, but here they are and you just have to deal with them. Two centuries of war. The Great Crusade had expanded far, and now the Imperium encompassed billions upon billions of humans. But a rift had begun to form, a festering wound that had finally spilled into a question, a decision that needed the approval of only the Emperor. The use of psychic powers within the Legiones Astartes. The Edict of Nikea. Two sides have been drawn up. The pro psychers Magnus the Red, Sanguinius, and Jekatai Khan, versus the anti psychers Lehman Russ and Mortarian, and in part, Corvus Corax and Rogel Dawn, others refusing to take a side. The grand debate for the future of those who manipulated the powers of the war was overseen by the most powerful user of that art, the Emperor of Mankind, and at his side stood Constantine Valdor, no judge, but a loyal guardian. Constantine himself did not feel strongly for either side. He had seen the misuse and danger of this power during the Unification Wars, against the vile, self-declared priest-king Mollard Sen. The connection to the war, that realm of madness left him cautious of the influence of the great enemy, the gods of chaos, that had ripped the Primarchs from the palace centuries ago. And yet his lord, his king, was a psyker. Constantine had seen his emperor wield his abilities for the good of the Imperium. He knew the value of astropaths and navigators whose existence and powers were vital to the survival of the Imperium. Keeping an empire's logistics alive with their very connection to the war. The Council of Nicaea had begun, each side presenting their case with passion. But all turns into disaster with the revelation of the Primarch Magnus's hubris. He had delved too far. He and his legion were unstable, burned like a hand too close to the flame, as they were walking the path of those who had brought about the horrors of old night, the age of collapse from mankind, whose scars were felt upon every world in the galaxy, a time of rampant, uncontrolled psychic nightmare. Constantine saw the matter put to a close, as the Emperor declared the banning of psychic powers within the Astartes legions, a decision whose consequences would ripple across the galaxy. With Constantine and the Emperor returning back to Terra, the great work continued. The webway portal beneath Terra had been opened, its winding routes conquered and claimed under the banner of the Imperium. It was an alien place, its shifting, misty walls, its acrid smell, and the echoes of ghosts haunting the shadows and periphery of eyesight. Constantine alongside the Custodes, and members of the Adeptus Mechanicus, 
quickly garrisoned a long ruined Eldari city, its inhabitants long dead to an age almost lost to time. But the seeming path of victory turns to ash in the Imperium's mouth, as after years of building these foundations, it all came tumbling down. At the side of his Emperor, Constantine saw this figure of raw, hot psychic flame burst through the webway, all the way to the steps of the Golden Throne itself. The psychic wards the Emperor himself had placed, shattered. The figure with one baleful eye exhibited a startling panic as Constantine and his brothers began to fire upon it, their shells passing through the apparition. The palace began to shake, and equipment exploded, taking an untold number of lives. The figure in psychic fire looked to the Emperor, and in those eyes that had seen countless suns and civilizations die, he answered him, Magnus. The panicked, miserable Primarch answered, Father. Behind the projection of Magnus, a tide of laughing, unholy, vile sounds rushed like a tide. Constantine, the Custodes and the Emperor charged the demons. Magnus's breaking of the psychic wards of the Emperor had doomed terror. The webway was under assault, and the Immaterium tried to flood in only stabilized by the Emperor's might. Magnus had broken the Edict of Nikea, but most importantly he had broken the dream for the species. The Emperor, for all of Constantine's life, had remained controlled, his displays of humanity waxing and waning over periods we would call lifetimes, but his fury was obvious. The censure of Magnus was ordered immediately and a contingent of custodies and sisters of silence led by Constantine were sent to aid the Space Wolves Legion, the Thousand Suns rivals, in the seizure of Magnus to stand trial upon terror. Arriving within the Prosperine system, Constantine was united with the Primarch Lehman Russ. The enormous figure drew up close, boisterous and lively just like how he had been when the two had met near two centuries ago. If Constantine was the warrior carved in marble, unmoving and stoic, Lehman Russ was the animated, living thing that drew all eyes upon him. Lehman and Constantine, both weapons forged by the Emperor's personal hand, yet where one exemplified order, the other was freedom. Constantine, despite his cautions, liked the Wolf King. He liked the Wolf King like how he liked uh, Pr uh, Primarch Ushitan. Because Ushitan also, you know, he strived for freedom and the enjoyment of his existence. Uh, just like how Lehman Russ is right now. So yeah, I can see why he'd like him as well. Even if at times their natures mix like oil and water. You claim to speak for my father, but you are not his blood, are you? Not like we are. That's what really gets you, isn't it? You're his instruments. He toss you aside in an instant if he cared to. We though, we, we're family. Constantine was an instrument. Something he had told Ushatan long ago. He was to be cast aside when he was no longer needed. But the idea that Lehman and all of his brothers believed themselves to be family, with a man so far above mortal connections, puzzled him. Was this part of the Emperor's manipulation? It's what I've always believed, you know, that this is all part of the Emperor's manipulation of his Primarchs, you know, calling them my son, my son. But he was never truly a father to many of his sons, you know. Um, he he had the time well i've been told he didn't have enough time uh you know to help his sons particularly when it came to conrad curse particularly when it came to angron angron and uh the the nails that were in his skull he could have helped him he could have helped uh conrad curse with what was happening with him and his you know his his 
his curse, I could say. Like, he could see into the future. He knew what was going to happen. And, you know, he tried to change, or he didn't try to change. He kind of accepted what was happening to him. And he accepted the future that he had been seeing. But he never tried to talk with uh, uh, Conrad Kurz and tried to explain to him that, you know, you don't have to follow down that path. There are many other paths you could take. You know, he never really had that connection with these two particular sons, you know. And there's so many other Primarchs uh, that I wish he could have talked more to, you know. And also the way he treated Petorabo like another tool. Well, Petorabo, uh, well, he had his own issues, you know. He wanted to be loved. He wanted... Uh, to be recognized, he wanted to be seen as useful, so he also had his own issues. Um, but you know, when I think about uh, Corvus Corax and his planet, or should I say, the the planet and the moon, you know, when he finally conquered uh, the, I think there were slavers on the planet uh, with his freedom fighters, and you know, the emperor came by and told him that you know you have to come with me now you have to come with me now to uh, complete my vision of conquering the entire galaxy and leave your planet behind you know he should have given his son Corvus Corax more time to stay on his home planet and fix the problems uh, on his planet and then he could join the emperor in conquering uh, the rest of the galaxy but he never gave him that opportunity he never gave him that opportunity Angron was taken away from his planet as he, uh, him and his people were about to topple or destroy the uh, uh, leadership on, on his planet he was taken away his comrades died on the battlefield you know and really there are just so many examples where I just see the emperor not really being a father. He he was so hung up on his own personal, uh, you know, ambitions and his goals for humanity, building the webway, you know, making sure that it's ready for whatever grandmaster plan he is trying to make here, you know, and then he left the 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 responsibility of a father to his other sons you know his other sons had to take care of the troublemaker sons and that's not something a father should be doing that's not something a father should be doing huh. a way to keep his tools loyal or a display of his rare humanity slipping through Constantine was bonded to Lehman Russ in a way he was not with the other Primarchs. The Apollonian Spear, one of a pair alongside the Dionysian Spear, gifted to Russ, both forged by the Emperor's hand in the Age of Strife. The Apollonian Spear was gifted to Constantine at his ascension to the role of Chief Custodian. Each foe struck down by the blade, their very soul, their core being would flash through Constantine's mind in an instant. Each conflict, where thousands upon thousands died at his hand, he left feeling like he knew every one of them. Koja Zhu, Ushatan, corrupted Terran zealots, Xenos all laid bare before him. It was a gift from his lord, an augury into other lives that kept the threads of his own humanity together. He was a man, despite his transformation. His humanity was too precious to lose to indifference. As a so, so his spear, you know, opens the thoughts of whoever he kills with the spear. Is that how it goes? Like he will understand everything there is to know about that particular person after he's killed that person with his spear. Is that what it can do? Huh. All right. The forces of the Imperium were set to loose themselves upon the Thousand Sons. New orders had come in from the War Master. The judgment had been changed to annihilation. The planet burned, and the wolves of Fenris roared. 
as the custodies marched. Billions of lives were lost, and each thousand son, such as Phocis to Car, Constantine cut down. He saw their treachery, their gene flaws. He saw them become monsters in his own mind, mutated beyond recognition. Thirty Astarte stood against him, each gifted with prescience, but still they fell single-handedly to the unbelievable strength of Constantine. Oh yes, the Thousand Sons, uh, they were afflicted with a disease, if I can say that, the flesh change disease, you know, that morphed them into these monsters inside their suits. But uh, Magnus the Red did find a cure for them. I'm just not sure how he did it or how he obtained the cure uh, for his sons, but I don't think it actually worked. For the thousand sons i'm not entirely sure but yeah you know you can imagine the kind of pain that the thousand sons astartes have been going through they've been keeping this a secret from everybody else the only people that knew about what has been happening to them as a legion is themselves the thousand sons and their primarch you know who's been trying to find a cure to their affliction so yeah hmm. The hubris of Magnus had brought him here, and at the moment of victory, the Wolf King victorious in his duel with the Crimson King, they vanished. The Thousand Sons were gone, and in the ashes of a world on fire, amongst the failures and hubris of another Primarch, Constantine came the closest in his entire life to anger. They are the architects of this. Their monstrous pride, it could have been prevented, yet when the hour came, we merely watched them being born. Man ought either to be indulged or utterly destroyed. For if you merely offend them, they take vengeance. But if you injure them greatly, they are unable to retaliate. So that the injury done to a man ought to be such that vengeance cannot be feared. The Battle of Prospero had ended in disaster. Their objective failed. Returning back to terror, Constantine heard the news that would change the fate of the Imperium forever. The War Master Horus has declared open rebellion. Alongside the Emperor's children, Death Guard and World Eater legions, open rebellion was now alive and like a malicious disease that would wash across the various worlds of the Imperium. Constantine confided in his fellow custodian. He had been there when Horus Lupercal had been discovered by the Emperor. He had watched him, seen him learn and grow into command of his legion. He had seen him be crowned War Master at the triumph of Ulanor. He knew the hidden pride that lay beneath the humble mask. He pondered on the idea of a building resentment fostered outside of the Emperor's influence, but it did not add up. It was not enough to fuel a rebellion. Perhaps something had driven him to it. The Imperium was in shock, lines were being drawn up, and sides chosen. The realization of Horus's betrayal had called into question the burning of Prospero. Billions had died, and a legion had been destroyed on the false orders of the War Master Horus. Lies upon lies upon lies that have been created are now coming back to haunt this Imperium of Man. Lies upon lies. Constantine had seen their corruption, their genetic faults rupture through the Thousand Suns as they delved too deeply into their psychic powers. But the fact that their destruction was architected by a traitor pained Constantine. With the return of the Primarch Rogal Dawn to terror, preparations for defense and retribution was enacted. With much of the Emperor's attention drawn to the webway, under assault, underneath the Imperial Palace, 
the war in the material was left to Dawn and Constantine. And you can imagine, Dawn doesn't know really like you know what's influencing Horus and his other brothers uh, into betraying them like this. He doesn't know about chaos. He, I don't know who tells him in the end, or maybe he figures it out. You know, as soon as uh, the traitor legions land on Terra. And then he witnesses, you know, the kind of creatures that are coming off the ships. They're not Astartes anymore. They are these abominations. Maybe that's when he realizes, okay, there's something going on here. There's something wrong here. But, you know, you can just imagine the shock of their lives to find out that, you know, there are entities out there that are able to manipulate us, to use us as their weapons, as their tools against our fellow human beings, you know? These lies that have been designed by the three people, <laughs> uh, the Emperor, uh, Malkidor, and uh, uh, um, the Captain General of the Custodians, Valdor, you know, they've been keeping secrets, they've been making lies, and they believed that with this strategy of theirs, it's going to maintain, uh, uh, you know, stability and society and, you know, nothing is going to happen but here something's happening the lies are coming out the truth is like a sledgehammer that's going to break the imperium of man you know into millions of pieces the dream is dead seven legions were sent to bring these traitors to heal to rip them out of their hole on the world of istvan five constantine had always been cautious of the legiones astartes he found those feelings more and more reinforced when the further disastrous news reached the throne world. The Night Lords, Iron Warriors, Word Bearers, and Alpha Legion had turned upon their allies. Three Loyalist Legions had been decimated, their Primarchs missing. The Battle of Isfahan V, one of the bloodiest, most mind-numbing, Cacophonous battle sent the Imperium into disarray. Constantine and Dawn began to lock down Terror and the Soul System, preparing for the battle now that would inevitably come to their doorstep. Constantine knew the capabilities of Horus. His first meeting with a Primarch, Alpharius of the Alpha Legion had taught him a lesson. He needed to put himself within a traitor's mind, to understand them, to understand how to fight like them. Terror, already under the watchful gaze of the custodians, blurred the line into a surveillance state. The probability of spies for the War Master lurked in the shadows. Many people and worlds had been forcibly complied into the Imperium Sphere, and there were plenty who had no love for the Emperor. The galaxy began to burn. As the traitor's fortress began to spread out like dark fingers, shadowing worlds under their vile grasp. The Imperium was falling apart, as various warp storms began to cut off whole sectors, making communication impossible. It was becoming clear that there was something more to this rebellion. Just as Constantine had suspected, there was a dark benefactor to the War Master's actions. Whispers of vile rituals, human sacrifice, creatures of nightmare that did not seem like Xenos, the great enemy, the gods of chaos. The secret known only to the triumvirate of the Emperor, Malkador the Sigilite and Constantine Valdor. But now the secret was out, and the fury of many such as Dawn was ferocious to be kept in the dark against such dangers they had prosecuted a war the great crusade in the name of the imperial truth bringing humanity across the stars out of the darkness away from the ignorance of mysticism and the enslavement to belief and yet there were creatures in the war entities that called themselves gods creatures that answered the prayers of the desperate and cruel the truth had become evident to the emperor Malkador and Constantine, that this was a war for the species, for its very soul. A war against enemies that would use every foul trick in the book. 
Constantin began to take the steps necessary to fight that war. Within a dark corner on terror, Constantin, draped in robes and hiding his identity, made his way into one of the Imperium's most inner sanctums. There he met with perhaps the most dangerous men and women within the Imperium, the Officio Assassinorum, chemically and genetically altered killers, crafted and armed with technology beyond the reach of most within the Imperium. An order who had operated directly under the Emperor. A necessary tool, for some enemies could not be reasoned with. Appearing before the Assassinorum Council, it was Constantine who became the architect of a plan to deal with their enemy. A united task force from all sub-schools of the Order, working in tandem on one target. Horus Lupercal. Men ought either to be indulged or utterly destroyed. For if you merely offend them, they take vengeance. But if you injure them greatly, that they are unable to retaliate. So that the injury done to a man ought to be such that vengeance cannot be feared. By any means. By any means necessary. Yes. Horus needed to die. Emperor's son or not, he was a threat to his master. What some would consider cowardly, others might call expedient. Constantine's movements had not gone unnoticed by the Praetorian of Terror, Primarch Rogel Dawn. He confronted him. Clearly disturbed by the Constantine responded that the two are the same. To Constantine, the Imperium was the Emperor. The singular vision at its heart. He could not imagine an existence without him. Did he fight for the man or the dream? Was he even capable of defending humanity from the Emperor? Which would he let die first? The species or the master? The, the species. He would let the species die, not his master. Remember, he is transfixed on the Emperor. Whatever the Emperor says, whatever, whatever happens to the Emperor, he will be the first one there to defend him, no matter what. That's, that's his purpose. He's a tool. The tension between these two demigod-like figures never went away, as Dawn left with a distasteful feeling. Any feelings of shame, any wavering of morality that would run through our minds never entered the rigid, egoless temple of Constantine as he left terror in preparation for the assassination of the traitor, Horus Lupercal. By any means. Would you? Dawn's fury was palpable, crackling in the air around him. I'm sure my father is capable of defending himself. And tell me, Captain General, what kind of victory exists in a war like the one you would have us fight? He jested at the room around them. You see, this is the arrogance that, you know, we've been discussing about in terms of the Primox. You believe, oh, your father cannot be touched. He's so powerful. Nothing can touch him. Nothing can hurt him. If it were you, I, I'm telling you, Rogel, your father would be dead, and you'll be surprised. You'll have a Pikachu face seeing your father being uh, killed by Horus Duprakau, you know. But here, uh, Valdo knows that anything and everything can happen because he understands now the threat that Primarchs uh, uh, have on the Imperium of Man. Ever since uh, the incident with Alpharius, you know, when Alpharius... Uh, stated that you know you have to understand or you need to know you know if someone were to betray the imperium of man how would you operate in that type of situation and here he is he is doing and executing a plan to protect the emperor from uh, what rogel dawn would consider to be impossible someone to attack the emperor anything can happen rogel a war fought from hidden places, under cover of falsehood. Innocent lives wasted in the name of dubious tactics. Underhanded, clandestine conflicts fueled by secrets and lies. For a moment, Valdor half expected the Imperial Fist 
to rip up the table between them, just so he could strike at the custodian. But then, like a tidal wave drawing back into the ocean, Dawn's anger seemed to subside. Valdor knew better, though the Primarch was the master of his own fury, turning it inward, turning it to stony, unbreakable purpose. This war, Dawn went on, sparing Malkador a glance, is a fight not just for the material, for the worlds and for the hearts of men. We are in a battle for ideals. At stake are the very best of the Imperium's ultimate principles. Values of pride, nobility, honor, and fealty. How can a veiled killer understand the meaning of such words? They don't need to understand the meaning and the value of such words. The threat remains. The threat remains, and that is your brother Horus Liprakau and his uh, traitor brothers and legions. The threat remains. You must use whatever you have to defeat this enemy because, you know, coming here with this chivalry code of yours or this honor code of, you know, having a fight out in, in public where everyone can see you guys and spectate this great battle uh, between brothers fighting for the heart and soul of the Imperium of Man. Yes, that all sounds nice and, and beautiful for books and for movies and, you know, for, for purely entertainment purposes. But when you are in a war like this, where, you know, the enemy possibly has an upper hand on you, you need to use tactics that they will never suspect you ever using against them. You need to start thinking outside the box. You need to do things that maybe you've never truly considered as, a, as an avenue to use against your enemies. That's what happens in wars. You always try to find an upper hand against your opponent, no matter what. All of this stuff you're talking about, it sounds so nice. It sounds very nice, Rogel, but I'm sorry, no. Valdor felt Malkador's eyes on him, and the tension in him seemed to dissipate. At once, he felt a cold sensation of conviction rise in his thoughts and he matched the Imperial Fist's gaze, answering his challenge. No one in this room has known war as intimately as you have, my lord. And so surely it is you who must understand better than any one of us that this war cannot be a clean and gallant one. We fight a battle like no other in human history. We fight for the future. Can you imagine what might have come to pass if Kel and the rest of the execution force had not been present on Dagene? If this creature spear had been reunited with the rebel forces? He would have attempted to complete his mission. Come to Terra, to enter the sphere of the Emperor's power, and engage his murder gift, said Sire Calexis. Spear? What is the spear that, uh... Valdo was talking about. Whoa, okay. He would never have got that far, insisted Sir Venus. He would have been found and killed, surely. The Sigilite or the Emperor himself would have sent such an abomination and crushed it. Are you certain? Valdor pressed. Horus has many allies, some of them closer than we wish to admit. If this spear could have reached Terra, made his attack, even a failure to make the kill, a wounding even. He trailed off, suddenly appalled by the grim possibility he was describing. Such a psychic attack would have caused incredible destruction. Dawn said nothing for a moment. And not to mention the Emperor is still holding back the demons in the webway. Now, if this uh, spear that they're talking about was successful in hurting or, at, or even killing the Emperor, imagine all of that stuff that he's holding back is just going to flow out on you guys. And then you'll be truly effed up. Yeah. 
It seemed as if the Primarch was sharing the same terrible nightmare that danced in the custodian's thorns, of his liege lord, mortally wounded by a lethal enemy, clinging to fading life whilst the Imperial Palace was a raging inferno all around him. Valdor found his voice once more. Your brother will beat us, Lord Dorn. He will win this war unless we match him blow for blow. We cannot, we must not be afraid to make the difficult choices, the hardest decisions. Horus Lupercal will not hesitate to- I am not Horus. Dorn. No one said you are, Dorn. No one said you are. That's, that's all on you. That's in your head. That's in your head. The rest of us are not talking about you becoming Horus Lupercal. We're just saying we need to think outside the box. We need to have one step ahead of the enemy. You are coming here thinking that you, uh, that they are saying that you are similar to uh, Horus Lupercal. No, man. We're not talking about you. It's not about you. Born snarled, the word striking the custodian like a physical blow. And I will. Enough. The single utterance was a lightning bolt captured in a crystal, shattering everything around it, silencing them all with an unstoppable, immeasurable force of will. Rogaldorn turned to the sound of that voice, as every man, woman and Astartes in the chamber sank to their knees, each of them instinctively knowing who had uttered it. The Sigilite was the last to do so, shooting a final, unreadable look at the prime mark of the Imperial Fists, before he too took to a show of obedience. The question escaped Dawn's lips. Father? The darkness, the great curtains of shadow that had filled the furthest corners of the chamber, now became lighter, the walls and floor growing more distinct by the moment, as the unnatural gloom faded. He blinked, strange how he had looked directly into that place and seen it, but without really seeing it at all. It had been in plain sight for everyone in the room, even he, and yet none of them had registered the strangeness of it. Now from the black came light. A figure stood there, effortlessly dominating the space, his patrician features marred by a mix of turbulent emotions that gave even the mightiest imperial fist a second pause. The Emperor of Mankind wore no armor, no finery or dress uniform, only a simple surplace of grey cloth, threaded with subtle lines of purple and gold silk, and yet he was still magnificent to behold. Perhaps he had been listening to them all along, Yet it seemed to be a defiance of the laws of nature, that a being so majestic, so lit with power, could stand in a room among men, Astartes and the greatest mortal psyche would ever live, and be as a ghost. But then he was the Emperor, and to all questions, that was sufficient answer. His father came towards him, and Rogaldorn bowed deeply, at length, joining the others that had bended the knee before the master of mankind. The Emperor did not speak. Instead, he strode across the shrouds to the tall windows, where the sailcloth drapes hung like frozen cataracts of shadow. With a flick of his great hands, Dawn's father took a fist of the cloth and snatched it away. The hanging tore free and tumbled to the floor. He walked the perimeter of the room, ripping away every last cover until the chamber was flooded with the bright, honey-yellow luminosity of the Himalayan dawn. Dawn dared to glance up and saw the golden radiance striking his father. It gathered its brightness to him, as if it were an embrace. For an instant, the sunlight was like a sheath of glowing armor about him. Then the Primarch blinked and the moment passed. No more shadows, said the Emperor. His words were gentle, summoning, and all the faces in the room turned to look upon him. He placed a hand on Dawn's shoulder as he passed him by, and then repeated the gesture with Valdor. No more veils. He beckoned them all to stand, and as one they obeyed, and yet in his presence, each of them felt as if they were still at his feet. His aura towered over them, 
Filling the emotions of the room, Dawn received a nod, as did Valdor. My noble son, my loyal guardian, I hear both your words, and I know that there is right in each of you. We cannot lose sight of what we are and what we aspire to be, but we cannot forget that we face the greatest enemy and the darkest challenge. In the depths of his father's eyes, Dawn saw something no one else could have perceived. So transient and fleeting, it barely registered. He saw sorrow, deep and unending, and his heart ate with an empathy only a son could know. The Emperor reached out a hand and gestured towards the Dawn as it rose to fill the room around them. It is time to bring you into the light. The Officio Assassinorum has been my quiet blade for too long, an open secret none dared to speak of, but no longer. Such a weapon cannot exist forever in the shadows, answerable to no one. It must be seen to be governed. There must be no doubt of the integrity behind every deed, every blow landed, every choice made, or else we count or not. His gaze turned to Dawn, and he nodded slowly to his son. Because of this, I am certain, in the war to come, every weapon in the arsenal of the Imperium will be called to bear. Okay, Emperor. All right, all right. Um, yeah. You know, where he says that both sides have it right, like he hears their concerns, he hears their points of views, and he agrees on both sides. Um, I still lean firmly f far more towards the side of Valdor on this matter, you know, uh, where they have to use any means necessary, any plans, uh, no matter how underhanding they may seem to other people or cowardice or expedient you know to other people they must be used because at the end of the day it's who is the victor in this war you know not those who uh, had you know an honor code of of chivalry and, and and respect of the enemy no no those people they're not going to become the victor not in something like this not against uh, the chaos demons and you know their push against the uh, Imperium of Man. So I, I side more with Valdor and you know his plans. Um, and where, where, where uh, the Amber King you know stated that Rogel Dawn saw some sadness or sorrow in the eyes of the Emperor or the face of the Emperor. You know for that split second um yeah i'm not really buying that i don't know i don't i i just anytime when someone would want to say that the emperor feels pain or he feels sadness or he feels sorrow i'm like but where was all of this when he met corvus corax no not corvus corax uh conrad curse where was that because uh, 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 um, Conrad Kurz needed a father he needed someone to help him with his uh, predicament you know he was mentally I could say mentally unstable really he was broken just like Angron they were broken people and their father was just not there for them he was just not there for them he just gave them their legions and told them to go on your way on conquering the galaxy in my name or in the name of the Imperium of Man. He never truly helped them. And I think that's something that I'll always remember whenever I see the Emperor and, you know, they tell us that, oh, he's feeling pain, he's feeling sorrow. I'm like, but then where was all of this when he's very... Chil when his children, the people that he calls his sons, are screaming for help. You know, they, they, they want guidance. They need guidance. They need 
to be helped in whatever mental uh, situation that they have. But the emperor is not there. But now I must understand that he's, you know, having pain. He's, he's, he's having some sadness because of what's happening uh, to his dream or what's happening to his sons uh, like Horus Liprakau. No, no, no. And, and the time when uh, he was berating Conrad Kurz, you know, telling him, uh, you, you had a choice. You didn't have to do the things that you did, but you followed, uh, you know, this uh, a future that you saw. You know, he blamed him for everything that has happened. He blamed him uh, for, for, for not changing as a human being. But how can he when you as his father is not there to guide him on that path? He needed someone. He needed you. He confided his deepest secrets uh, to Pilgrim instead of coming to you as the father. You know? You sent, I think it was uh, Lionel Johnson uh, to come uh, to, 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 to Angron, you know, and to tell Angron, you know, to stop your senseless violence, your senseless destruction of, of planets and, and killing of people. Instead of you as the emperor coming directly to Angron and to tell him to stop, you send someone else to do that job for you. I understand the part with Magnus the Red and Prospero. He couldn't go physically because he has to stay, uh, you know, in the golden, uh, the, the golden throne to prevent the demons from entering into the webway. I understand that. That's why he could not leave Terra to head over to Prospero to apprehend Magnus the Red. You know, he had to send his custodians. He had to send a Primarch there as well to, to do that job. But all these other situations uh, pertaining to his sons he was not there he sent other people out to do it and yeah i just I, I i am indifferent to how he might feel right now as the emperor you know and fighting against his uh son that's been taken over by the chaos demons i am indifferent to him like i i don't i don't really care that he's feeling sorrow or pain you know? Yeah.